It's interesting. I I read obituaries, and uh, a common denominator in obituaries is not uh, how much assets the person accrued in their life or their GPA class standing that they achieved or how they were able to manage a busy schedule. Usually uh, the common denominator in obituaries is how that life made an impact on uh, others, their family, loved ones, animals, our city. And uh, it's why here at Northminster Church for this opening month of a new year, we are thinking about how to love our neighbors. Um, how can we increase the love? Stephen Covey, the uh, life guidance writer, uh, was the one that taught us to begin with the end in mind. And this is why as a church, uh, we are wanting to start this year thinking about how the greatest thing is love. How can we be living a life of love? And what if our love for God and our love for others was viewed by others as even bigger and taller than our steeple? I remember when I came to this church years ago as, a, as the new pastor that uh, some just kind of mentioned to me that, you know, this church is known for its architecture. Uh, this church is known in Tucson for its steeple and the shape of its buildings. And I wondered, how is this church known for the shape of our hearts, the shape and height of our love? Uh, last Sunday uh, in worship, I was impressed, uh, as I think you were, in hearing Pastor Ken share the numbers of our end-of-year special projects. And I want to give some update to those numbers, because for me, they are acts of love. Not bragging, please, but celebrating uh, love demonstrated in this church. On December 19th, we almost spontaneously took up a special above and beyond offering for Mercy Chefs, a Christ-centered organization that provides hot, good meals for those uh, who are victims of that tornado swath in the Midwest. Uh, and we raised $6,665 uh, to provide meals on the ground in Kentucky and surrounding regions. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, we devoted all of our offerings to start up a Northminster Tornado Relief Fund. And we're gonna make plans this coming year, maybe years, to uh, partner or provide ongoing relief for uh, the churches in Mayfield and other cities. And uh, we received $7,508 for that tornado fund. And we'll keep you updated on that project. Our Advent Gift of the Heart uh, December into January special project was aimed at providing uniforms and school materials for children to go to Christ centered schools in Ethiopia. And I'm so happy to say uh, that we have received for that project $15,882. So praise be to God and thanks to you and us. Uh, that kind of generosity is what love is about. But I've got to tell you as your pastor, Jesus goes before us. And Jesus has a habit of having us climb higher and higher to keep up with him and how we demonstrate life-changing love that meets needs and saves lives. And so it's in that spirit of following Jesus that I want you to turn to our scripture today. We have it projected, or you can turn in your Bibles. We're in the New Testament. Uh, our reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5. And we pick his teaching up at verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 
The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Well, God, we thank you for your holy word. Please help us now, Holy Spirit. Help me with my words and all of us in our reflections to hear your voice, Jesus, and to respond in faith. Amen. So can we talk about juicy fruit? Any of you remember that gum that bears the name juicy fruit? Yeah. It, I mean, it tasted good, but the flavor would be gone in like four seconds. And what's the point? And it makes me think, are we cows just to chew a cud? And, and why? Uh, don't get me started on gum. If you can't swallow it, what's the purpose? Um, So let me ask, uh, how are you doing with your fruitful resolutions? This is the 9th of January, and uh, most experts say by the 7th or 9th of the first of the month, uh, resolutions are off the table. You can get back to me on that maybe in the courtyard, okay? Um, I've been thinking about eating well, losing weight, you know. Um, And I read a book this last year that said, You should try to eat only one meal a day, but then at other points, if you're hungry, only eat fruit. Only fruit? And then I thought, well, what about about fruit juice, you know? Uh, This is plant-based. Okay, come on. All right, all right. Well, I'll put the, I don't want it to be a distraction. And what about vegetables? I mean, I think we need fruit and vegetables. And um, I have some ideas for you that I really believe will bless you. You might want to write this down if you're tracking in your sermon notes. Here's the idea, and I get it from Galatians. Fruitfulness in your life comes from rootfulness. So I brought these tomatoes with me because I'm really proud of them. Uh, I grew them, and I, we have this plant that just keeps kicking these out. And I just, I, I've never been so excited about a plant in my life. Uh, I go out there about once a week, and there's scads more, little red beauties like this, and they taste great. And we, oh my goodness, and it just keeps cranking out. And you know me, you know I'm not a garden-obsessed kind of guy. Uh, This is quite an achievement for us. Right. Now, contrast, I have one orange. We have an orange tree. And every year, the orange tree has been a champ. I mean, we've given bags of oranges away, uh, which is better than zucchini. We... We've given oranges away, the oranges taste. This year, we've had like three. Three. And I stare at this orange tree. Oh, and we've talked. What's going on? What's the matter? Best I can figure, this last year, we started this new high-tech little drippy irrigation system with little tubes when I used to just gush water on this thing, hand water, and I'm pretty certain we've had three and a half oranges this year because our tree's not getting enough nutrition water in the roots. Do you see where I'm going here? 
right? Here's my metaphor, and I believe it's a biblical metaphor. Fruitfulness, produce in your life, comes from how you're receiving nutrition for your roots. Tending to the roots of godly nutrition uh, resource will promote godly fruit and living in your life. And so Paul, in our reading from Galatians, is trying to coach us on this. He wants us to be abounding in a life of godly fruit. That's what I was talking to the kids about. In verse 16, Paul says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Holy Spirit of Jesus in you. You can think of this as a root transplant that begins deep within you when you open your heart in faith to Jesus as God's Son, your Savior. Because when you're essentially just living for what you want, what you selfishly desire, whatever whim or attraction is in your nose or eyes, those old roots of your old self will lead to ugliness. But when Jesus comes into your life in faith, the Holy Spirit of Jesus, of the living God, begins to work and prompt you from within. And over your lifetime, those promptings of God's Spirit leads to maturity, to real change and advancements, growth and fruitfulness, and yes, love. This is what I mean for each of us to have well-nourished roots of godliness coming into us. So it's a great spiritual question. Who are you walking with each day? How are you receiving your godly nutrition? Or are you walking more by yourself for yourself? In our reading from Galatians, you noticed it. Uh, there's a grim picture portrayed of when you live a life that's mainly for yourself, by yourself. The Apostle Paul lays out this tension that can work within us. He says, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so, they, so that you are not to do just whatever you want. Christians who follow Jesus' spirit lead are not to do just whatever we want. Because when we only seek out just what we want, it gets ugly in human life. I'd like to share with you how Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, uh, describes this scene that the Apostle Paul paints for us. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show, religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. Now, those are just words, but we've seen these things in life. We see this happening in the world. We've seen these toxic realities. And like the Apostle Paul, I believe it helps to call them for what they are. There's, a, there's an old story of a dad who was with his son and he was talking to an old farmer by his barn. 
And the dad was talking to the farmer about how he really only likes to talk to his son about just positive things in life and not to bring up the negative. And as the father was saying this, the farmer pulled a bottle of, a brown bottle of rat poison down from a shelf in the barn and just took a pen out of his bib and started scratching out the warning signs and over the top wrote, essence of peppermint. And the dad saw this. He goes, hey, hey, you need to stop doing that. You've just made that much more dangerous. And the farmer smiled and said, exactly. You know, have we seen the realities in our world? And can we call them what they are? Not to condemn, but to construct and rebuild with compassion. You know, college students sometimes go off on spring breaks to sow wild oats. When for some it's actually drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, which can lead to emotional damage. A man decides to leave his wife and kids because he's feeling stifled. And what he's really doing is serving his selfish desires and breaking sacred vows. A woman goes to have a medical procedure because being pregnant is the last thing she needs in her life right now, when really it's an abortion of a human life that will also bring emotional pain. Right now on TV, we are seeing a maddening proliferation of ads promoting sports betting. Oh, my goodness. And it's being promoted as just fun entertainment when really it's a wasting of important resources that can lead for some into a harmful addiction. You know, in the name of free and fun social media, some people take to hurtful mudslinging, destructive rivalry, as Paul calls it, that is having a divisive and corrosive effect in our country. Some of you might be thinking, oh, hurrah, too far, go back to your tomatoes. But have we gone far enough? Paul is teaching us Christians that when you trust Jesus, it brings about life changes of behavior that are positive, healing, life sharing. The Apostle Paul is stressing here that liberty in the gospel of Jesus does not mean licentiousness in our choices. He's very clear. Paul says, if this is how you're living, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But here's the catch. Paul is not saying it's just about us being more moral or having better do-gooder acts and behavior on our own strength. No, Paul is saying this real change will start to happen in you if you cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's in you. It's called becoming transformed from the inside out, <laughs> like my tomatoes. Right. I, there's this great story about a high school physics class where the teacher divided the class into two teams and each had a big metal drum. And he says, here's your assignment. Find the best way to uh, vacate the drum of any air, to get the air out of the drum. So one team went into the back closet and found an old vacuum pump, hooked it up to the top hole, and the thing started chugging away, and the air came out, and the, the metal drum started to crumple, but there was still some air left in it. The other group opened the top hole of the metal drum and simply began filling it with water. In a short amount of time, very easily, all the air was pushed out. And the drum was filled with a new substance. And I think that's what Paul is saying here in our scripture. We're not called to in our own effort just to simply eradicate bad behavior, bad habits, but to seek that filling of the Holy Spirit, which will change your orientation, change your outlook from the inside out. It's like my orange tree. It needed more water. It needed better nutrition. So here's how that filling works for us in real life. There's two continual choices in the life of a Christian. The first is continually crucifying the flesh. 
bringing those bad desires that are not healthy, bringing them to the cross of Jesus. Holiness in our life and improvement comes with continual acts of repentance. And repentance is a religious word that means make a U-turn from how you're living. Make a change. And it's not just this negative, self-critical action of depriving yourself. Repentance, biblically, is really more like a joyful discovery of finding the right route when you realize you've been lost. Secondly, it's a continual choice to try to keep in step with the Spirit. So who are you living life with? And, and are you just following yourself, or are you trying to receive that help from Jesus each day? He's the one who prompts you to have a second chance, a restart, to live with grace. And friends, you can find these filling stations of the Holy Spirit as you, make a, as you try every day to read from God's Word. Read the Bible. Make worship a key uh, spiritual discipline in your life this year. Uh, step up and say yes to serve in Christian mission or help. Volunteer. Or lastly, try to enjoy a lovely conversation with God every day. That's called prayer. You know, Psalm 1 uh, should not be overlooked on day one of a new year. Psalm 1 contrasts the living of a plant or life that is rooted in goodness versus a disconnected life. Uh, it reads, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Friends, this year, do you want to be a fruit vine, a fruit tree, or do you want to really live as a tumbleweed? Godly fruitfulness comes from godly rootfulness. And so quickly, let's, uh, uh, Dr. John Stott, a wonderful Bible teacher, he lists out how this fruit of the Spirit is listed in triads. These are the triads of godly fruit. First, there's the vertical group of fruit, the Godward fruit. And this is love, joy, and peace. And love here in our Bible is agape love, no strings attached. Love that you don't deserve, but it's love. Joy is uh, joy that's not based on circumstances, but because of God's presence. And peace is that serenity within. Uh, it's called shalom. And it's not just the absence of trouble, but abiding peace that carries you through. Then there's the horizontal group of fruit. This is more on the human living level. Forbearance, kindness, and goodness. Forbearance, uh, you can think of as tough patience. A long-suffering attitude of patience because you know God is merciful to you. Kindness is a sweetness that you offer to others in ways they need. Goodness is that inner compass of seeking the best for others as well as yourself. And then the last group, the last three, are more selfward or central to your life. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Faithfulness is not quitting. Not quitting on yourself or those you've committed to in life. Gentleness is not always having to get your way, but being able to be submissive to others and to God in life. And self-control is living life like a trained athlete. You're learning to master yourself because you have a blessed master who acts in love to you. And so the question is, how do I love? How do we love? I think, friends, it's all about the Holy Spirit of Jesus filling you and me from within. Godly fruitfulness comes from godly rootfulness. A writer, Martin Smith, has said, Scripture presents the Spirit as the awakener of desire and desire as a gift impelling us towards God. How do you today need the Holy Spirit to impel you towards God in a life of fruitfulness? Is this a year where you need to refresh 
and renew the resources nutritional of the Spirit for your roots and life? Is this the year where you need to fill that metal drum of who you are with the baptismal waters of Christ's new life? I want to close my message today with a video thank you message that we received recently from the Gospel Rescue Mission because it's such a beautiful uh, demonstration of what love and fruitfulness can do. As you watch this video, I'm going to warn you, it might provoke you to think about, well, what else can I do? As you watch this little video thank you message, think about what caused this to happen. It was not just a spontaneous thing. There was thoughtful leadership from our deacons of this church. There was prayer. It relates to partnering with an extraordinary Christ-centered organization in this city that we partner with to save lives, the Gospel Rescue Mission. Um, and it involved us as a church. So many of you brought in bags before Christmas to help gift and encourage men trying to restart their lives in Jesus for salvation. So I hope this video makes you think, how else can we love? How can I love? Please, Jesus, how can I love more?